Now it's time to welcome our special guest for today. Uh, for the first time on Guide to Culture, it's a great pleasure to have you on board. Endeavor, how are you doing? I'm doing fine. How are you, Frody? Very good, very good. So before we start talking about the film, can you please tell people what you do and where they can find your work? I put the, your uh, Telegram address up on the screen here, but you can tell people which platforms you're on and what kind of work you do. Yeah, I'm a right-wing video creator. I'm still on YouTube for the time being, but I'm more moving over to Odyssey and BitChute now. And I make videos about politics, culture, history, or whatever I think is just a pressing issue to the um, to, to the right-wing sphere and the issues that we face in the modern world. Sorry about that. I was muted. Uh, thank you so much. Can, can you tell me, by the way, uh, do, do I sound okay? Yeah, you're coming through loud and clear. Okay, good. Yeah, because I can't hear myself for some reason. I don't know what's what's wrong here. Let's dive into the film. You So you picked a film called Sissy from uh, 1955. Uh, how come you picked this film? Okay, so you can leave it to me to pick some weird film from decades ago <laughs> that no one's ever heard of before. I kind of have a knack for doing that. Uh, but apparently it actually is really popular in Austria and has been for decades. So I picked this film called Sissy, and basically it's about the Empress Elizabeth of Austria, or Sisi as she was called. Uh, she was the wife of Franz Joseph during the 19th century. And uh, the film, the, the plot of the film is not very, um, it's not very plot heavy, it's really simple. It just revolves around her as a young uh, duchess in Bavaria and how she meets Franz Joseph and marries him when she's a young girl. Um, and you know, it's not entirely historically accurate, but I don't think that's necessarily that important. And uh, basically why I chose this film is that I thought it was just such a beautiful and delightful uh, piece of European culture. And uh, it, it's a, um, a movie that was made by Austrians about Austrian history for Austrians. Now, that might not sound like anything out of the ordinary to someone who's not really initiated in, uh, in our sphere of politics. But when you understand how Hollywood works and how the film industry works and kind of the various narratives that have been created over the last few decades through this industry. Uh, what really struck home uh, about this movie, CC was that it is a positive portrayal of a European culture. And that's something that we don't get very often. So I guess the, the thing that, I, the, what I thought of when I saw this film is that this is the kind of art that we'd be making if we controlled our own historical narratives and film industry. Yeah, you'll you'll not find a whole lot of self-flagellating uh, behavior in this film. <laughs> you know, sort of uh, shame and ethnomasochism. It, it's just a normal. Uh, it's it's a very wholesome film, and it's very sort of over the top wholesome. It's like a it's like a Disney fairy tale, right? <laughs> yeah, it's basically like a Disney fairy tale uh, a put, uh, applied onto history. But you know, right. I think that that's not necessarily a bad thing because. Like my favorite genre of film is historical films. I've made an entire video about this genre and uh, it's declined over time. But I think that w the importance with, with this genre is not necessarily historical accuracy. I mean, that's a good thing if you can do it, but also it's more to mythologize your own history through the medium yeah. of film and pass that on uh, to, a to a next generation. So, um, you know, with, with this film, this was made um, about a century after it takes place, but, uh, about 40 years after the death of um, Franz Joseph and after the fall of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. But you can definitely tell that through this film that uh, Austria as a society in 1955 still had a very positive uh, vision of its history of, of this period. I mean, there's no, there's no liberalism in this film at all. There's no ironism attached to the institutions of monarchy or anything like that. They wanted to mythologize this history and present it to a new audience so that it's something that they could carry forward. And I think that that is really the, the purpose that historical films should should serve. I mean, that, that's what legends are, really. That's what legends yeah. have always been. I think that film can just be a medium for that. Yeah, and it's a, it's a healthy thing to have films that create and, and stories um, that create an emotional bond between the people and its historical figures. That is a very healthy thing, rather than having a, a, an emotional or a, sort of a that your imagination uh, goes in the direction of, you know, Spider-Man or something like that. We actually have historical figures and it's it's better for us, it's more healthy for us to have an emotional bond uh, to them rather than something foreign in a way. Uh, so, so yeah, I do think that it, it, the important 
aspect of these kinds of films isn't necessarily historical accuracy. And of course, the, the, the purpose with a film like this, and this isn't the unique film. This is in the 50s, there are many, many films with these kinds of values, these kinds of aesthetics. Uh, like I said, it's it's sort of, it carries all the stereotypes from a Disney fairy tale. And we are, we recognize those uh, stereotypes or those cliches almost uh, because they have been, <clears throat> because they have been repeated often and they are a normal part of our history. They used to be a normal part of our culture, but but nowadays we, we, we don't really have that anymore. And I do think that the 50s are perhaps the climax of this type of aesthetics, this type of, of values. I think that perhaps the 50s, even more than the 40s or 30s, this extremely over-the-top romantic image uh, and extremely wholesome. I mean, she's even uh, she, she's even like bottle-feeding the deer. I mean, <laughs> come on. <laughs> yeah, but, but I mean, would, you would, you, would you agree with that, that like the 50s are, are the top is like, <clears throat> they're even more uh, romantic and wholesome than the 40s and 30s were. There's something there in the 50s before it starts declining again. Yeah, I think I would agree with that. There are several films that you can look at uh, that have this kind of message. Uh, I'd say even the early 60s as well. I think of another film like Dr. Zhivago. That's another one of my favorites. It's, it's also kind of like one of these... Uh, Disney fairy tale kind of movies. Uh, and it is really wholesome. It has a fantastic message. It's a really feel good movie. Uh, and you know, again, it's not like not one that's super historically accurate, but it is kind of a, um, a mythologizing of history in a, in a way that, you know, people can enjoy it uh, decades later. Yeah. <clears throat> and the thing that I noticed when watching this film and, you know, what I, because of course I've seen many many films like this before, uh, but but when you watch it um, for a live stream, of course you see it in a different way, and you notice details, and you sort of reflect on um, the things you see and the values and the um, implicit messages in the film. And one thing that I uh, was thinking about is, you know, although this isn't historically accurate, and probably even by the, the standards of the. 50s it was extremely <laughs> wholesome in a way and, and sort of over the top but how much times have changed since the 50s that you know when the film came out it was probably relatable in a completely different way and i think it speaks volumes of how cynical our society has become that we see it as almost ridiculous you know yeah like I think that one of the problems we have is that we can't really understand the importance of uh, the various things that are portrayed in the film anymore, like uh, like honor or homeland or hierarchy. You know, one thing I was actually thinking when I saw the film is that the other the other films that actually seem to have a positive portrayal of monarchy are, like you mentioned, Disney movies. They're the mm -hmm. ones that actually seem to portray a, a hierarchical traditional order in the most positive light. Um, mm -hmm. and, and that's something that you just don't get from a lot of, from a lot of other films like if you can you can contrast um you can contrast it to a film like titanic for example um yeah. so uh now james cameron he he's not uh he, he is a gentile and he's more of an old left kind of guy so i wouldn't say that i wouldn't say that the film like titanic really fits in with uh the um with the new with the new left the new left that is attacking europeans on a racial level but titanic is a real critique of any kind of hierarchy any kind of traditional order it's basically attacking the old order of europe that being the one that was destroyed by world war one it's attacking yeah. that as elitist snobbish and kind of just disconnected from the reality of, of um, the, the ordinary folk but what's interesting in this movie is that it's a real it's a positive portrayal of the old order of europe um something right. that uh had already been gone for several decades at the time but you know i, I do feel that um a lot of the narratives that we've kind of been fed about this this order and about the first world war i mean we always talk about the second world war but uh the, the, the narrative from the left is usually that this old order was oppressive it was uh, elitist and it caused this horrible war and it killed a bunch of people but i think yeah. what we really missed though i i think that uh with, with the, where this narrative really goes wrong. I mean, it's correct that the First World War was terrible, and it's correct that a lot of the leadership of Europe at the time 
were irresponsible in thrusting them into the war and that many people, both the elites and the common folk were naive. But I think that the real tragedy is that that old order was destroyed and that old order was good. And right. the real tragedy is the loss of uh, the traditional Europe. And I feel like this film is really a celebration of, uh, of the old order, really. You know, I've always found it hilarious and ridiculous when leftists talk about the old sort of um, uh, monarchy, those kinds of societies, sort of pre, uh, pre-liberal societies as oppressive. Uh, because, you know, if, if you were living in the Middle Ages or earlier even, uh, and yeah, there was a, a sort of a hierarchy. It wasn't equ- it, it wasn't a society based on equality. But how often in a lifetime did you have to interact or have to deal with the elites? Like once in a lifetime, maybe I don't know. <laughs> it's like hardly ever. Uh, but now the elites monitor us every minute, and they sort of hide behind this veil of democracy. That yeah. Um, you know, it's you elected us, uh, you know, and and you're free now. Uh, but we monitor your every move and we would like to monitor your every thought and we'll call your boss if you don't. I mean, the, the contrast is ridiculous. And the, the claim that people were less free centuries ago is is completely ludicrous. Because, yeah, there was, a, a you know, a king or an emperor or... There were uh, elites, uh, there was a hierarchy, but how much day-to-day interaction did you have with them? Barely any, I would say. Yeah, you could pretty much go about your entire life and never, like you said, never even interact with the leadership at all. You know, they've yeah. really, they've really uh, poisoned the, uh, they've really poisoned the well in that uh, we now the 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 mainstream understanding is that anything that isn't liberalism must be oppressive and that must be totalitarian. When that really isn't the case, I mean. For God's exactly. sakes, they've locked the entire population in their homes for the last year. No <laughs> yeah. monarch in all of history has ever had that amount of power. And, exactly. You know, even like uh, I in even if you know you can't be the monarch, you still see uh, like the the, the little uh, village, the, the little uh, farmhouse, and you wish you know I kind of wish I was that guy in the farmhouse. You know, when you're looking at the modern uh, these modern cities with these skyscrapers and all the the degeneracy and the, uh, and, you know, the diversity agenda. You just kind of, <laughs> I kind of do uh, feel jealous of that guy who, you know, just lived in his farmhouse. Maybe he didn't know how to read, but, you know, he had a wife and six children and, uh, you know, he could spend his uh, his days out, outside and then um, <laughs> and they probably worked less than us too. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. And, and it is refreshing to see a, a portrayal of monarchy like this that is friendly and not hostile because that is the problem i mean let's face it when we have elites uh, that are outsiders making our you know cultural or creating our cult- cultural tropes and our uh, sort of cultural current cultural clichés they're doing it from an outsider perspective and they're mocking our history and they're not doing it from a there's a difference b- between a portrayal from the inside, someone who uh, the, who portrays an us versus someone who portrays uh, them, who they are hostile to and who they, I mean, th- their whole narrative, uh, I mean, the Jewish Hollywood elites and other elites, uh, their whole worldview um, is, is sort of built on this idea that they are victimized that we are oppressors and and therefore they have to mock our culture and and it is it is a huge there's a huge difference between the, the way that we have traditionally portrayed our own monarchies and our own history and how they portray it yeah and that's the and that was my main takeaway it's that this was a movie made by a people about themselves not an outsider about them like one one other other thing to contrast that with is uh even hollywood at the, at this time I've never seen a positive portrayal of the Roman Empire in any Hollywood movie. There's plenty in the 50s. And a lot of them, I actually like the movies. They're legitimately good. Uh, but, you know, you look at the early life section of the of the director of the movie, and mm. it's you're, you're meant to come away with the idea that Rome, and by extension, Western civilization, is evil. Like, uh, the classic example is the movie Spartacus. Uh, mm. Morgoth wrote a very good review on uh, the movie Spartacus. And it's an example of kind of our history has been uh, our historical narratives have been created by someone else and told to us in a way that it's meant to 
demoralize us. I mean, like, mm. you know, like you can take the example of the character of Franz Joseph from this movie. Every image that anyone ever sees of this guy, unless they're someone who's really interested in history, is, is as this uh, 82 year old man. And he's a uh, he, lo- he looks like this old grouch. And it's during World War One, just before he died. And he's sending uh, his men off to die in some horrible war. Uh, but I mean, with the, this movie, he's like he's like some Disney prince. He's some beautiful. He's this uh, beautiful, uh, uh, heroic-looking young man in uh, this uh, amazing palace, or like the scenes where they go hunting. I mean, it's it's just it's just absolutely fantastic. Uh, mm-hmm. But even I, even like the portrayal of uh, of a lot of these characters, it, it's really interesting that they don't try to shoehorn liberalism in there. So like Franz right. Joseph, he was a reactionary guy uh, by all accounts uh, of what I've read of him. Uh, and even during this during this time period, he there was like this huge conflict with Hungary. Uh, the second film kind of gets into into this, but um, needless to say, he uh, he wasn't a liberal in, by any stretch. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, and then also the film portrays him as someone who actually uh, you know takes uh, the uh, the traditions and the uh, the norms and customs of the uh, of the royal family and of a monarchy very seriously. Uh, there's an interesting part at the very end of the film that. Uh, the and, uh, the mother she's also a, an interesting character as well but uh franz joseph's mother mother sophie she scolds cc for running around the palace barefoot and then there's two older women that come in and they bow and they bow to her they bow to cc and she says she's uncomfortable um she's uncomfortable having some older woman bow to her like that and franz jo- joseph reminds her that well now you're you are the uh, highest woman in the austrian empire and that now <laughs> they they must all bow to you and mm. you know i i just think that I really enjoy that it actually has this positive portrayal of these kind of traditions because usually that's like shown in Hollywood as being really elitist and being really um, and, and just kind of being something that uh, just the uh, these this out of touch elite really care about and something that doesn't really matter and you know in post modernity we can't really understand concepts like honor but uh, mm. in here in, in this film it's actually shown as being something that is pretty important if you actually want to have a stable. A hierarchical order that's able to actually um, to actually create a healthy society. These norms are actually very important. Yes, <clears throat> and uh, this is something that <coughs> pardon me. Th- this is something that you know the left is obsessed with symbols, symbolic issues. Right, the left is obsessed with questions of pronouns. These. Ir- irrelevant symbolic things that aren't really irrelevant because in the long run if they get to determine which symbols are accepted and which symbols are not accepted then they run the show uh, and the left understands this but the mainstream and the right doesn't really because there's something about uh, how the the mainstream or conservative brain is wired that Generally speaking, white wingers don't understand the importance of uh, symbols and symbolic figures. And this is a problem generally with uh, monarchy because now monarchy is criticized. The monarchs are all cucks, right? I mean, all the monarchs in Europe, they're, they're, they're very unimpressive. Um, but as a symbol, I think people don't really appreciate how important monarchy is as a symbol because what it is it isn't just uh, this is a person who has you know more money and and has more luxury the monarch is a living symbol of national unity really uh, and that is it, it is a living symbol that people uni- that, that unifies the people <clears throat> and without it you just have the modern state as an administration not as a focal point of national energy and national identity and and that is how uh, liberalism wants to portray the state of course that it is just uh, an administrative unit a territory where and the politicians and the the government uh, just has an administrative job uh, and there's a bureaucracy etc but there is no the, the what is forgotten completely is the symbolic value of the unity of the nation and that is uh focused on the the king or the emperor or or whatever it may be so 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 this is a thing that is constantly mocked in the modern world and of course uh you know the 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 new thing is that 
um, the royal family marries outside of royalty because that used to be a principle that you only marry other, uh, you know, high nobility. But now, for example, the princess of Sweden, um, she married this sort of just average guy, gym owner, right? Uh, and uh, and uh, we have, of course, the the uh, what's he called in in. England, who married Harry. this Megan? Yeah, exactly. So I mean, th that is th that is this is a project. This is a very conscious and very um, deliberate project by the left or by the global elites or global sort of narrative to be hostile to uh, monar monarchy in general. But the reason they're hostile to monarchy is because it's actually important to us. It's one of the very few symbols that we have left. Yeah, a character that I actually really like in the in the film and in the following two films as well is uh, Franz Joseph's mother, uh, Sophia, or Sophie rather, uh, and she's kind of portrayed as being a vil uh, a villain. But I think that is kind of an incorrect interpretation of her character. Uh, mm -hmm. Throughout the first, uh, at the end of the first film, she's like scrutinizing Cece, saying, "Oh, is this girl good enough for my son to marry and to be the empress?" Uh, and then throughout the, se the second, uh, the second film and the third film, the two of them have a lot of conflict. We get together; they they get into fights. But um, you know, I think that what's really interesting about her character is that she's a, uh, she's a very strict woman that uh, wants to adhere to these um, these old customs very uh, like with an iron fist or like with a fine razor, however you, however you, however you say it. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, and by all accounts, her, uh, as the actual historical woman was a very strict woman in her time. Uh, but I don't think she's she should be seen as a villain because in the second film, uh, when there's this big argument between her and Cece and then uh, Cece's mother comes to try to sort it out, she says to her that don't never uh, don't don't think that I don't I don't love Cece. I just think that you know as she's such a young woman and and can't take on all these responsibilities. Um, and then in the third film, when uh, she actually when Cece has health problems and throughout uh, the Empress Elizabeth's life, she had. Uh, she had a lot of health problems, though she actually died of an assassination. Um, you can tell that Sophie is definitely heartbroken by this. She is. She does feel absolutely terrible that her daughter-in-law is f having this horrible uh, health uh, problem. And she actually has to say to her son that, I, I'm sorry that I have to always be the bearer of bad news, but you must think uh, if she is to die and, we, and you need a male heir, uh, you must remarry because our, the Habsburg uh, dynasty must continue. And, you know, today you might think that this is kind of just some elitist uh, woman who just uh, is like a real a real snob and a real, uh, you know, uh, hor horrible person. But really, uh, her role is kind of, the, it, it, you know, because also Franz Joseph was an extremely young emperor at the time. But uh, her role is kind of to be the protector of that uh, tradition, to be the protector of the, um, the various norms and customs that actually make monarchy an effective symbol like you mentioned uh to that, that actually can unify a country mm. yeah and i you know that is that is how uh royalty how 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 those old elites have also seen their role as unifying symbols and they <clears throat> they have that responsibility um so this is not just you know a life of luxury and of course yeah i mean it, it, there is a big difference uh between people who have to, you know, work hard and they're poor and whatever, uh, and 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 the royal families who are born into wealth, and some people think it's unfair, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't have royalty. That doesn't mean we shouldn't have aristocracy because they do carry uh, a lot of meaning. And the fact of the matter is that there are very few symbols left now that connect us to our history that give us an identity other than just you know our wallet you know how, how much money we have uh, what kind of car we drive and you know things that are completely connected to bourgeois values of wealth and and the uh, sort of individualism and that is really that that is one of the ultimate things that that uh uh, the left wants to accomplish is to create a narrative that is completely individualistic where everyone is just this interchangeable unit right uh, and why why would we oppose mass immigration it's that's just another person who can do this job or you know it, it's it's just making people interchangeable is at the core 
of the, the modern project. Yeah, and what the left does is they kind of apply a selective nihilism. So mm -hmm. when it comes to our symbology, the things that are that matter to us, then they're completely nihilistic. Like, oh, well, why do you care about this flag? It's just a, a piece of material. Who cares if I burn this flag? You know, who cares about this statue? It's just a piece of rock. Mm -hmm. But then on the flip side, like you mentioned, they are absolutely fervent when it comes to symbology relating to, um, I don't know if I can say on the stream, but uh, relating to certain uh, historical events in World War yeah. II uh, as a, and then... Um, other other uh, happenings to this group of people throughout history, they are very, very strict about you respecting that. And that is not something that you can apply any ironism towards at all. And it's no. even the same thing with like Black Lives Matter, like, you know, making the, uh, like sending around the the, jo the joke Valentine's Day card uh, with George Floyd on it saying, you take my breath away. Uh, people mm. got, some police officers got fired for that because, you know, they built oh, up yeah. this symbology around Black Lives Matter. I mean, they have George Floyd and some, golden casket for god's sakes uh they have um the democratic party kneeling down in the uh, in the congress building i think that's where it was for nine minutes for them like this is symbology and then you mentioned like the lgbt stuff so they're absolutely mm -hmm. fervent when it comes to uh, uh to enforcing this the symbology that is used to um subjugate us but when it comes to things that are actually valuable to us they're completely nihilistic like they they say it has no value whatsoever Another uh, dynamic in the second film that actually is really interesting is how this relates to because uh, because the the, the the second film largely follows um, it largely is about the relationship between Austria and Hungary following the uh, revolution of 1848. So for anyone who doesn't know, uh, there was a, revol a failed revolution in Hungary in 1848. There was a rebellion. Austria uh, invaded and crushed the rebellion. They had they had Russia come help them. And uh, there was a really bad relationship between the two uh, countries, that, which were part of the same empire uh, for the next couple of decades. Franz Joseph was the abs became uh, the absolute monarch of uh, Hungary, and then ruled it um, uh, through neo absolutism for a couple for over a decade, actually. Um, and what what's really interesting in the in the second film now it's the the historical timeline's a bit off, but uh, it it's about the Hungarians like really wanting that they're like demanding their respect, and like, there is this what they're at this one reception, and they're the Hungarian delegation is just outraged that um, that the Empress Sophie didn't uh, greet them in the in the correct manner or something like that, and, uh, and then uh, Cece has to come in and reconcile with them that by uh, offering the, uh, the I forget what he was the the, the ambassador from Hungary by offering him a, a dance, uh, then it's kind of like bringing the, the uh, two countries together. And the film concludes with uh, with her being her and Franz Joseph being crowned. Uh, king and queen of Hungary when it was turned into a dual monarchy. Now, mm -hmm. the, of course, that actually happened about a decade or so later than the film actually portrays, but that's beside the point. What I thought was interesting was that uh, the, 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 way that the, the way that the country Hungary in the second film is the, the ambassadors, they're very uh, adamant about the their um, country being respected and about uh, the uh, Austrians standing up to these uh, or these Austrians following these really important, uh, these really important uh, monarchical customs, like the, the way that you greet someone, the way that you dance with someone, how, how you address someone, they see that as really important. And, you know, I think that the problem with the right today w when it comes to symbology and, and honor is that we've kind of internalized the left's game against us, that mm. since they say that all of our stuff are just uh, ironic, it's all nihilism, it's not, it doesn't matter, they just uh, mocked all of our traditions, our answer should be that, well, there should be nothing that is sacred. So, you know, if we just mock, uh, you know, the, the pronouns crowd or BLM or whatever enough, of course, you know, the mainstream might will never say mocking the other group that's in power. But, um, mm. and, and the, 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 the problem with this, this response is that, that's incorrect though there actually are things that uh you that you should stand up for and you should actually stand up for yourself when somebody disgraces your honor like and we're at the point today where they can make uh i mean the propaganda back that existed back then but it was nowhere nearly as bad like they're at the point where they can make films like Django Unchained or Hunters which are basically just murder fantasies against us and there's no pushback because we're told that we don't have honor. You see, to be to be offended like that, oh, well, you're a right-wing SJW. When no, actually, you actually have to stand up for yourself uh, and yeah. to stand up for your own honor because it is very important for attaining respect.
I mean, the the purpose of Django Unchained and the uh, Hunters, etc., <clears throat> it is to desensitize us to our own genocide. That is literally the purpose. And it's it's to make it kitschy, to make it funny, to make it silly, so that we ah, ha, ha, sit and laugh at our own genocide, right? And it's to 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 make it less dramatic, less less big of a deal, right? It's not so big of a deal uh, that that we're being genocided. So so what? I mean, so what if uh, if if you know if people are white in the future or and and th th that's exactly correct what you say there that the mainstream right and to an uh, 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 and to a degree that I uh, find problematic, <laughs> the the radical right has internalized this narrative of the left that symbols aren't important and that uh, we look at these problems, which are should be pro problems uh, dealing with symbols and our own existence and s really sacred issues like this existence of our race and existence of our nation, the existence of our uh, culture and our historical figures, these should be religiously worshipped issues, but they have been reduced to pragmatic issues of IQ and uh, uh, how much how much does mass immigration cost in terms of expenses, money, how much do we pay for mass immigration? That shouldn't matter at all. That should be not even a secondary issue. That shouldn't be mentioned even, how much mass immigration costs in terms of tax dollars or uh, euros or whatever country you live in, right? And and it, it, it's not a matter of, you know, what IQ or what pragmatic use we can make of the immigrants who come here. Oh, it's better that we have Asians coming here uh, because they're more intelligent and therefore more law-abiding. They don't cause as many problems. That, you know, those kinds of bourgeois liberal, actually liberal values are completely overemphasized by the right and they shouldn't matter to us because these should be religious issues. It's the existence of our people that is at stake, not, you know, uh, the the GDP or something like that. Yeah. Uh, the other thing I wanted to uh, I wanted to discuss with this film is the imagery of land and of the, uh, the idea of homeland. I, like, I, th I found that... Uh, I just love this film just from the very first shot of Bavaria with, with the the Duke of Bavaria, Cece's father. He's there fishing and there's these guys in this in these, I don't know what they're called, traditional German clothes singing while they're on a raft. And then his like seven children come running down to the dock to greet him or something like that. I mean, it's really beautiful. Uh, and, and then, of course, the scenes uh, where they're uh, walking through the mountains and hunting. But you know what, what? What you get the sense when you see this is that uh, this is what a traditional society should look like. You know, a homogenous society under a natural order would develop to look something like this. It, it feels like all the symbology is in place, and you really don't get that in a lot of modern films. Like, you, it's, it's hard to. I mean, for example, uh, you don't even have to look for at a film for this. But when you go to one of these uh, traditional villages and then you see a pizza hut or something. It's almost like kind of uh, the outside world is now like invading uh, kind of this, uh, the, um, well, not the outside world, but it's almost like there's a cancer kind of growing on a uh, traditional society. It's almost like globalism yeah. is this a disease that's like springing up through the ground. You know, I noticed this when I was in uh, the UK because I'm from, I'm from uh, Toronto, which is, you know, I don't live there anymore, but it's a, a typical progressive cosmopolitan city, which is, which is just a bunch of piles of glass and steel everywhere. But what I noticed when I was in, um, what I noticed when I was in the the city Newcastle in the UK in particular was that it almost looked like th like the contrast between the traditional English society and the new globalist society was really really sharp. So you'd look you'd look uh, to one side of the street and then you'd have these this old church that's been there for eight hundred years. You have this beautiful architecture, but then you know you you walk for one block and you come across. I don't know, some like LGBT district or something like that with a bunch of Dorito signs and people with, uh, and you know, a bunch of women wearing burqas or something like that. And uh, you feel like it's called almost like a, uh, a cancer that's kind of growing on a, on a traditional society. It's like completely out of place. But what I noticed in this movie is that it seems like everything is in place. So it's what a, um, a, a society under the natural order would develop something like that. Yeah, I agree. It's sort of unfortunate that we are more, you know, we're 
by now we're used to seeing those kinds of signs of globalism and mass immigration uh, in big cities, but we notice them even more when we go to the countryside and then we see, you know, if you go, you can go to a, a small town in North Sweden, you know, um, north of the Arctic Circle uh, and <laughs> and uh, you'll, you'll find Somalis. It's <laughs> bizarre, you know, <laughs> in a small town in the very north of, uh, in the north of the north. And, and you'll still find uh, find symbols of globalism there, and it's we notice it more definitely. And just like you say, yeah, in, in you know the, the, that scene where the kids come down to greet him. Now, how would the kids look today? I, I I was actually thinking about that very detail when I was watching the film, you know, because I knew we were going to talk about this film, and <laughs> I was thinking, okay, if that film <clears throat> was made today. And set today. I mean, it's enough that it would be made today because they they do this re retro uh, actively, right? Um, how would the kids look? What would they? How would they be dressed? Would they be like transsexual kids? These are you know the things that we take for granted back then. All those things, even the smallest detail, uh, are are changed in the current dystopia. Yeah, I think that good art is usually made by a people for a specific culture. And that is where it, it that, that is where, you know, art actually feels authentic. And I even think, though, that you don't necessarily need to be part of a, that culture to actually a, 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 to actually appreciate it for that, that reason. Like, for example, I'm not German, I'm not Austrian, but I can still see this film and uh, appreciate it as this is like a an authentic culture making art about itself and that and that feels a lot better than you know if they tried to cram everything in there and appeal to the entire world you know i i read that this film was actually popular in china and that uh i know that in east asia they actually do have a great appreciation for traditional european culture that isn't uh kind of the perverted uh the perverted variety that we get today you know that they actually want when they when they go to europe they want to see um they want to see a castle like like the one you see in this movie. You they want to see uh, England as you'd have, you'd envision it through uh, one of like a Charles Dickens novel or something like mm. that. Sure uh, they don't. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Like uh, yeah. even someone who's an outsider still wants to see uh, a, a. They still want to see the authentic culture, even if it's one that they're not part of. That is still something they can appreciate. But then when you try to insert like uh, diverse, you try diversity cramming. You, uh, the other thing that also bothers me, and maybe not quite as much, but also is when they try to insert liberalism into these films. So you'll have some uh, 17th century monarch who is a femi who like is a feminist or something like that, or uh, <laughs> some uh, some like 17th century monarch who like talks about, oh well, is, wouldn't it be better if we just gave all our wealth to the poor or something like that? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> like I think of uh, I think of the movie like the, uh, the movie uh, uh, the, what's it called? Uh, Kingdom of Heaven, basically. Uh, and that's an awful, awful movie. But um, the, the entire movie, <laughs> it, it, basically the, the Crusaders are all secular liberals from the 21st century uh, mm -hmm. talking about how we need to really uh, watch out for the Muslims here because, you know, it would be awful if um, it, would, it would be awful if, if we actually, you know, won this war or something like that. It's, it's really ridiculous. But, you know, mm -hmm. you, you actually when you, when, when you see art like this, you actually want it to be an authentic reflect reflection of the culture that it's born out of. And mm. with the modern Hollywood, you just can't have that because it's made for absolutely everyone, meaning it uh, it appeals to nobody. So, you know, when you get uh, something, uh, you know, the classic example, the Star Wars movies or something like that, it, it appeals to absolutely no one on earth because it's just this uh, fake consumer product that's just made to appeal to both per uh, push a political agenda and to just appeal to a mass market. And mm. the end result is that no one enjoys it. Mm. Definitely, with the the modern, uh, the, the the new Star Wars films will never reach the same legendary level uh, of just you know being loved by the people as the old ones. <laughs> mm. uh, that's I mean that's that's never going to happen. Uh, and um, you know, the BBC will make a. a a film of one of Shakespeare's plays, and they'll have, you know, the king is black or something. And it's, they do this all the time. Uh, and it is, 
it doesn't work. It's forced uh, and it's contrived, and it doesn't come natural. And it's it's really you know it's really visible there because they try to make oh this is a colorblind film. No, it wasn't an accident. You weren't just like picking a person at random, and it happened to be a black actor to play the king, right? So, so th that's the that's the problem because when they're quote unquote making these things uh, colorblind, for example, I mean that's just one example, but like you said, feminism, all the other things as well. But yeah, I also find liberalism and globalism offensive when I see it in non-white cultures. I mean, if I see it in other countries. I prefer to see, you know, African things in Africa. I prefer to see, you know, Asian things in Asia and Middle Eastern things in the Middle East. I don't want to see globalism there. And there's, you know, um, there is the an old version of the right, uh, and th this still sort of lingers, you know, uh, the with conservatives. And this is something that I brought up in a show that I did with Mark Weber. We talked about uh, Rich, Pat Buchanan's book on the Second World War, Churchill, Hitler, and the Unnecessary War. And he, you know, Pat Buchanan is a conservative. He thinks that all the, the world is going to shit now. You know, America is going down the drain. But he sees as the high point of Western civilization is when we brought the civil service to India and when we built railways in India, when we basically tried to westernize, or we, you know, the British, uh, tried to westernize India. Uh, and what I pointed out in that conversation with Mark Weber is that, no, that is actually a part of the problem. That is why, that is a major reason to why we ended up where we ended up now, because that is all that, that's based on universalism and globalism. And that's a problem when it hits us, but it's also a problem when it, we go out and try to globalize the world because it always, you know, um, it, it always flies back at us. It, it always, there's always this backlash. And that's why we have to be very conscious of globalism and liberalism as a problem in both directions. Mm -hmm. On the point of uh, how modern movies will now uh, cram in the diversity, you know, I think that they kind of, uh, you know, the left, the establishment, whatever you want to call them, they kind of uh, push themselves into a corner here because on the one hand, they'll put this, they'll put this uh, diversity in the film and everyone who's, not, who's being honest with themselves, it hits them like a brick. Um, it hits them like a ton of bricks in the face when, you know, you're watching this film and, and Anne Boleyn is a black woman or something like that. <laughs> or even like even 1917, which is a movie I really did like. I, I really like the movie. Uh, but you see that they, they have like they sprinkle a bunch of Africans in this British unit, uh, which, you know, would, wouldn't have actually been, uh, you know, if they, if they were even in Europe, they would have had their own unit. They wouldn't have been uh, in the same unit together. But you see, the problem with it is it it takes you out of the film because you know that. Uh, a political issue that's going on in the real world is being forced into this movie. And uh, it's becoming more and more noticeable. Like there was this one really awful one of uh, the, f the movie um, Darkest Hour. You know, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's not a very good movie to begin with, but um, there's a scene where Churchill goes to the, it's about Winston Churchill and he goes to the underground and the people give this uh, like rousing speech to tell him to keep fighting the war or something like that. But there's like this one black guy on the Metro and the camera is on him for like 24 seven or the, the entire scene. He's like dead center. And the funny thing is when I watched this movie, I actually, ha I, I was watching it with my friend in the theater. My friend was Chinese and uh, he, he um, said to me, were there any black people in Britain at the time? <laughs> uh, so, you know, it just hits you like a ton of bricks. But then on the flip side though, they can't really make uh, art for us that is uh, reflective of our history anymore because, mm. you know, like let's take a movie like CC for example. It shows you a homogenous traditional European society without their without their agenda, without the, the changes that they're bringing in, and mm. that's going to resonate with people on a deeper level. So they, it, it's just not worth the risk. They cannot show you that because it gives you other ideas. So they want to completely remove from your entire consciousness, any uh, idea that you ever had a traditionally homogenous society. Oh yeah, I mean, they wanna, they wanna remove any hint in our culture, any hint that sort of sets us apart from other, uh, from other people, that, that sort of anything that can remind us of the fact that we are a people separate from other peoples. I mean, there is, Sweden has had some absolutely ridiculous examples of this 
uh, just on of the top of my mind, one example that I can think of is a, a book that was criticized, um, a book about chopping wood. You know, uh, uh, <laughs> and you know because it it brought to mind you know countryside. Uh, it's it, this is Nordic Nordic countries with you know chopping down trees and uh, a cabin in the woods. It seems like a very implicitly white theme. Same thing with ice hockey. Oh, that's that seems like a sport for white people. That's not acceptable. And the the, the left will latch on to these things. And definitely, a film like Sisi couldn't have been. It would be impossible to make it today. They can't even make fictional films like that. And, you know, like uh, The Lord of the Rings, even that was criticized because the cast is too white. And it sort of, it reminds, it, and of course, it's it's a story based on ancient European, North European culture. So it, it would only make sense to have the cast white. No, but, but, but that's not acceptable. So, yeah, even the smallest things and a film, uh, a completely harmless film, like CC will drive the left insane if they try to make it today. Yeah, and it's always interesting to see like them justify why something is wrong when we, I mean, we know that they're simply just anti white and anything that po portrays us positively, they'll be against. But even like you'll see that they'll post, uh, there'll be some white family that posts a picture on Twitter of them with their four children or something like that. And, mm. the, it, and even just that picture in a completely apolitical context. You'll get leftists retweeting it, and then they'll 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 be outraged at this very picture. I mean, we know that at, at the root of it, it is because leftism is a anti-white and frankly genocidal ideology. Mm -hmm. But uh, it is interesting to see that to see them try to justify that because I think a lot of them don't actually think that that's what they're doing. But they like the ideas that have been put in their head. They've been designed to see see an image like that and associate this with bad. To so associate yeah. this with evil, so you'll see them like twisting themselves into knots. They'll say, "Oh, they're destroying the planet with climate change, or something like that," or uh, "Oh, these are future uh, white supremacists, or something like that." And you, you just see that uh, e even just the most um, the most subtle of imagery will actually send the left into a frenzy because they know that they can't allow us to have that. Yeah, yeah. I don't. I don't think that most you know leftists are conscious of what this is you know in a, in a bigger picture i think this is just for most people i mean for some people sure they, they have more sinister agendas pro probably right but for most people on the left this is simply a case of out signaling each other right because we we have a reward system in our society that you are rewarded for leftist signaling right but then if you if everyone is left is signaling then i have to outcompete them because otherwise no one sees how good i am right and, and so i we have you have to outcompete each other i have to outsignal you all the time and you have to outsignal me because otherwise you don't get any re rewards and it's a reward system that is that is it's it's you know it's set up in our society and it leads to to these insane results but it's sort of a machine that has a life of its own but of course, there are some people who who have you know their own agendas and whatever. But I I think that for most people, it isn't conscious. I don't think they're aware of of what they're actually doing. Yeah. So I think I think that uh, what we have to do is that we have to take these uh, these works of art from our past, our these films, uh, paintings, stories, and stuff. And uh, you know, I think that the dissident right needs to be the we need to be the ones to kind of preserve these because. They're, like we said, they're, the mainstream is not going to make any more of them. But, you know, we have just such a, a huge trove of these things that it's almost like an endless, it's almost an endless supply. You could go the rest of your, of your life never and never watch a new movie and, ne and never read a new book. I'm not saying you shouldn't do that, but just theoretically, and you could be completely uh, satisfied with everything that already exists. You know, there's mm -hmm. so many, uh, there's just, there's just so much out there that we mm -hmm. can draw from. And you know th that's why I wanted to choose this movie because probably uh, most of the audience hasn't hasn't ever heard of it unless they're from Austria or Germany. Uh, but yeah, it's a movie that I had never heard of until I saw it uh, on YouTube a couple weeks ago. Um, but you know, it's just an example of something that we can that we can take and then show this as you know an example of a, of a positive portrayal of European society. Even if you know, even if we're not Austrian, we can still hold this up as a as a good work of art. And uh, you know, that's something that we really need to start doing because. Um, the left is is, is going to come for these things, and they, they don't want to allow us to have any of them. So I think that you know by finding these gems of our culture here and there, and 
uh, repackaging them and, and using them for our purposes today. I think there's a lot of value in that. I mean, yeah, if, if I had a daughter, I would prefer that she was watching, you know, CC rather than some modern thing with God knows what kind of educational messages in there. Um, uh, so, you know, uh, b because those educational messages in moder modern films and modern literature and modern everything can be quite devastating. Uh, so I like to keep these shows to around an hour and we've been going for 56 minutes right now. So uh, are there any final thoughts you want to leave us with before we wrap this up? No, I would like to just say that definitely uh, check this movie out. It's a delightful, uh, fun, happy movie about a positive European identity. and. It's definitely one that I'm sure that everyone in uh, our sphere will enjoy. You know, maybe if you're if you're a big action fan, it's not a very uh, it's not an action packed movie or, or anything like that. There's no battles or wars or anything. But uh, <laughs> if you if you just if you just like you know really really wholesome, uh, uh, f almost like fairy tale like storytelling, then it's definitely one that you should check out. Excellent, and of course I've put uh, endeavors. Uh, telegram channel up on the screen there so everyone go in and follow endeavor on telegram and while you're at it if you haven't follow up, followed us do the same go to follow guide to culture on telegram as well and uh, the schedule for the decameron film festival is rolling across the screen and we'll be back in a few hours at 9 p.m central european time with Academic Agent, and we're going to talk about There Will Be Blood, a completely different kind of movie. Uh, and of course, if you want to support the fundraiser, please go to guidetoculture.org forward slash donate. You can help us out through entropy and through crypto and any way you like. So uh, Endeavor, thank you so much for doing this. Let's, uh, let's do this again sometime. Thanks for having me on, Frody. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, and everyone out there, see you guys later. Bye-bye. <laughs>